Hi, my name's Kevin Hicks. Welcome to my YouTube channel, The History Squad. Now, some time ago, I made a video about the feudal system and the, the rank structure of an English army during the medieval period. So what I thought I'd do is about time that I made a film about how they raised an English army during the Middle Ages. So, raising a medieval army in England is quite a complex subject, so I've tried to break it down, simplify it, if you like, for me. Uh, first of all, they didn't have a standing army, right, in the medieval times. So you had to rely, first of all, on the old feudal system. But in 1285, there was the Statute of Winchester, which actually changed everything. First of all, he had, he had commissioners of array. These arrayers had a royal authority or a royal warrant, if you like. And they laid down certain things, like if you held land or rent from between two pound and five pound, you had to serve as an archer. And there was other things as well. If you were selected to march with the army, they had to supply you with your horse, your clothing, your pay to go to the muster point, or you were held until they had enough men to march you away. And there's further complications. If you lived north of the River Trent, which part of my family did in North Staffordshire, then they didn't serve abroad. They stayed in England ready just in case when our king went across to fight in France, the Scots invaded, right? They also had a reserve, and I think it was uh, within six leagues of the coast, the south coast of England. They were the Garde de la Mer, the Guard of the Sea. So men had to stay there in readiness. And there were also... Uh, little quirky ones about how many men went to serve in Wales because there was always a bit of a something going on between the English and Welsh. So it's complicated. And then there's a further complication. And I love this. You might end up in a garrison, in a castle somewhere. And there are extra laws laid down for this, which I'm going to cover in a little bit. We'll just get back down to the commissioners of array, the arrayers. So the array system, the commissioners of array, as I call it. So the king, I've got a little bit of an extra model here. The king, Henry V, he's decided, or he's been persuaded, that he has a just cause. It's going to be a campaign in France. He's going to assert his authority. So the first thing he needs is an army. So he will have his arrayers, and they're just over there. These are men of authority. So they would have an armed escort. They've got the king's warrant, all of that kind of stuff. Don't mess with them. Now, what they will do is they will go to various places around the counties, for instance. And uh, then these places are known. Messengers will go out. And noblemen, the chiefs of noblemen, will have already been notified by the king's messengers. And they will have their own retinues ready to be inspected. So he's a nobleman, he's got a couple of knights, and then all in his livery, he has his own household unit, if you like. You might have a nobleman who will turn up. He's there in all his armour, he's got his horse, and this guy here's got one, two, three archers, four archers, and four men at arms. But that's what he has indentured. We'll, we'll cover that in a minute. Uh, there's another uh, nobleman has turned up here. He's got uh, just one man at arms, actually. And then two, four, six, eight, ten bowmen. But if you're an important nobleman like the Earl of Warwick, you, you, you will have hundreds, if not thousands, of troops ready to go. But the way the array system uh, works is it covers everybody, every aspect. If you look at, let's say, the county of Yorkshire, it has to give you X amount of soldiers, but that doesn't include York itself, right? And they could negotiate with the arrayers how many troops they're going to give. And if the arrayers are saying, we want 120 bowmen, but you've only got 110, you can negotiate. So all over the country, these arrayers will be going. They'll be raising the different troops, the different sections. Now, if I've done an extra model. So... Before we go any further, because it does become complicated, let's cover the different kinds of troops, not in what they carry or fight with, but 
there are different categories. So first of all, volunteers. You might be a forester or a gamekeeper or summit. You're fed up and uh, you want a bit of adventure and away you go. You, you go and volunteer. You find out where the arrayers are, the commissioners of array, and you simply turn up as a volunteer. You'll then be attached to a household or there might be a gang of you volunteers. You may have fought before. You might be professional soldiers. So you're going to re-enlist. You're a volunteer. Then you're, you're indentured soldier. Now, this is quite interesting because you could have a full doublet, coat and everything, the colours of your master. Yeah, the Duke of Gloucester here. Um, or you could simply be a household member who's uh, indentured for life to his master. So you could work at Warwick Castle. Do you work in the in the kitchens maybe but your other job is you're actually a billman so you would wear these colors well not these you'd wear perhaps this one in me hat somewhere i've got the old ragged staff and that of warwick and it, what it just shows is an indentured man at arms an indentured bowman he belongs to that lord and master here's the guy who is paid he's paid a good wage might have a house good clothing a bonus every year. You've got to keep these guys uh, really sweet. Well, the king could outdo that because the king could cherry pick from all of the households. And he describes these guys of being fair guys, good humoured, but the best bowmen. So your household retinues, they're indentured. They sign on the dotted line. And those indentures are fantastic because uh, I used to have one for my old house where they cut the parchment and it's a, it's a double copy. So you take your part, but the boss keeps his. And then when it comes to being paid or there's a problem, the contracts are put together so they can be read. So you have your volunteer, then you have your indentured retinue, your soldier who is lifelong or he is temporarily employed, but he wears the colors and the badge of his master. Now, interestingly, if you needed some more soldiers and you couldn't get enough, the king could pardon criminals, which is quite interesting because there's a certain conflict going on in a certain Ukraine at the moment, and apparently there are criminals being released by a certain person in Russia. So, hey, the wheels of history turn, don't they? So your retainers, your domestic workers, all of these people are actually indentured. Your hired guy who comes along, he might have been in service for years, but he's still hired and he's, he's retained. We've got your yeoman, your king's top of the line guys. The whole system works. And what I've done with my model here is, um, it's the one I used for the camp recently, and I've cleared it to be the center for array, where you've got to go, your muster point. So I've got the arrayers, the commissioners of arrayers, they're all there with their little camp set up. And I've got a nobleman coming in, he's, he's not very well off, and he's bringing in one, two, three, four, five men at arms and a couple of bowmen. And then over here, we have somebody who is actually testing any bowmen that have turned up, because it's not a case of you turn up, you say, oh, I'm a bowman. No, you've got to be proven. And I have I remember years ago reading that it was 10 arrows a minute. You've got to be able to shoot 10 arrows per minute accurately and under power. And I've trawled my books and I've trawled the web and it keeps coming up. Eight or ten arrows, ten arrows, ten arrows or twelve arrows. But I can't find the original little worm that uh, tells me where this comes from. But it's lodged in here. So if you've got any idea, when they proved the bowman beforehand, how many arrows did he have to shoot per minute? Now, ten is pretty good because these guys, if they can do it quite easily, then they will be able to sustain their shot during combat. So it wasn't a case that you just turned up. If you were no good, you were turned away. And there's also another little dodge. 
if you weren't feeling up to it, if you had a great excuse, your wife, daughter, and your daughter's daughter's daughter are all pregnant and are all about to have a baby, you could pay a fine instead. You could try and bribe the arrayers, but from what I gather, that didn't work. You could find yourself in trouble. But uh, I think this is a great system because it makes sure that you get the best. And I got re recently asked, what happened if you fell ill when you're on campaign? Well, the wagon train, they will have wagons for the sick and the wounded. And also, if it, there is a fight, a battle, as it's at Agincourt, the not-so-fit bowmen and the sick, what we used to call in the army the sick, lame and lazy, they would be in the baggage guard. So there would be a place for them if they could still stand. So the system, from the king to his arrayers, to his chief nobleman, to their lesser noblemen, all the way down to your bowmen. They all had a place, the way they were recruited was set down in law. So the household archers, these retained archers, were, were regarded as the elite, and it was the Earl of Warwick, uh, the, the kingmaker, who actually said that one of his household bowmen, one of his retained bowmen, was worth two of anybody else's, even English ones, he states. But there's a piece here, I'm going to read it, and uh, it was the, the top of the class of bowmen were the king's bowmen, the yeomen of the king's, and it was recorded in his household account, The Black Book, and he says, uh, Edward IV, that his, his bowmen were to be most seemly persons cleanly and strongest archers and these had to be chosen and tried out of every lord's house in england and the way he spells england here i love this it's y-n-g-l-o-n-d yingland <laughs> that's fantastic so just to wind this up i can't remember if, if i mentioned about the levied men are you? the county levy and the, the city levies if you're a levied man you've been conscripted right and there were strict rules and regulations about this. For instance, you couldn't serve abroad, but you could serve on what they regarded as homeland territory. So you could go to Scotland to fight or into Wales and the Isle of Wight, that kind of thing. But then they extended it. Because uh, Calais was England and uh, parts of Normandy were regarded as England, even though you as a levy have been conscripted, let's say, in Nottingham, you could find yourself in France in an area which is uh, regarded as England. And likewise, if you were a resident of Calais, you might be French born. You might be a resident. You're in there. Uh, you could suddenly find yourself in the levee from Calais and you could be serving down in Normandy. So there are these little twists and turns. As I said at the, at the beginning, this is quite a complicated subject. So you're levied soldier. You're conscripted your household, your volunteer, yeah, they are all part and parcel of raising a medieval army in England. Well, I hope you enjoyed our little video there. If you did, please like, share and subscribe. And don't forget to turn on the all notifications button because we have so many different subjects coming up on the on the history game finally i have a shout out for some of my patreon members damian with them declan barney and jeremiah thanks a million guys because of you i can do this